Hello everyone. Today we will cover two topics. One is gastric outlet obstruction and another one is the perforated peptic ulcer. So to begin with gastric outlet obstruction. Gastric outlet obstruction is uh, not a single entity. There are two well-defined groups of causes for gastric outlet obstruction and they are divided as benign and malignant. The two most common cause of uh, gastric outlet obstruction are gastric cancer and pyloric stenosis secondary to peptic ulceration. Pyloric stenosis secondary to peptic ulceration previously was more common. Now with the advent of potent medical therapy, decrease in the incidence of peptic ulceration is noted and therefore gastric outlet obstruction nowadays should be considered malignant until proven otherwise. The term pyloric stenosis is normally a misnomer as the stenosis is seldom at the pylorus. Instead, if there is underlying peptic ulcer disease, stenosis is found in the first part of the duodenum. As the most common site of the peptic ulcer is the first part of the duodenum. So, pyloric stenosis is a misnomer. We have another term that is known as true pyloric stenosis. So true pyloric stenosis is a rare condition and can occur as a result of fibrosis around a pyloric channel also. Chronic duodenal ulcer after many years undergoes scarring and cicatrization causing total obstruction of the pyloric region leading to enormous dilatation of the stomach. The major benign causes of gastric outlet obstruction are peptic ulcer diseases, gastric polyp, ingestion of uh, caustic or corrosive injuries, pyloric stenosis, congenital duodenal web, gallstone obstruction, also known as the Bobrett syndrome, pancreatic pseudosis, and bezoars like tycobezoars or phytobezoars. These are the benign causes for gastric outlet obstruction. Similarly, we have malignant causes as well. So, it includes pancreatic cancer which accounts for around 10 to 20 percent of the cases, duodenal cancer, ampullary or periampullary cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, gastric cancer or metastatic tumor to the gastric outlet. So this slide shows multiple polyps Coming to the features of uh, gastric outlet obstruction, in benign gastric outlet obstruction, there is usually a long or prolonged history of peptic ulcer disease. Patient may present with following symptoms of gastric retention with early satiety, blotting, or epigastric fullness, indigestion, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain, and weight loss. In some patients, the pain is severe in epigastrium, which may be persistent, or in other cases, it may largely disappear. Nausea and vomiting are the cardinal symptoms. The vomitus is characteristically unpleasant in nature, foul smelling, frothy, it 
totally lack bile and is of large quantity. Very often it is possible to recognize foodstuffs taken several days previously. Loss of periodicity is seen. The patient commonly loses weight and appears unwell and rehydrated. Weight loss is more significant in malignant causes. Patient can have mental confusion and tetany as a result of hypokalemia. On examination, it may be possible to see a distended uh, stomach with a visible peristalsis and a succussion splash may be audible on shaking the patient's abdomen. Positive succussion splash is done in gastric outlet obstruction patient who is nil by mouth for four hours. And it is done by placing a steto over the epigastrium and then the patient is uh, shaken adequately. On shaking, splashing sound will be heard. And if we hear splashing sound, then the test is positive. A dilated stomach may be appreciated as a tympanic mass in the epigastric area or left upper quadrant. Visible gastric peristalsis may be seen or elicited by asking the patient to drink a cup of water which will move from left to right side. We have a test that is known as Oscultu Perfection Test. It is done for gastric outlet obstruction and it throws a dilated stomach. This test is done by placing the stethoscope over epigastric region and then the skin is scratched from left side downward at several point away from the epigastrium using a pencil. So from left side, we'll proceed toward the right side. So when the scratching is made over the stomach, the scratch sound is audible. And when it goes beyond the stomach outline, the scratch sound disappears. So a point is marked at a junction of sound being heard and disappeared. So several points are uh, taken and they are joined and ultimately they form a line which denotes greater curvature of the stomach. So in gastric outlet obstruction, the greater curvature may reach below the level of umbilicus due to enormous distension. We have another test which is known as the uh, Goldstein saline load test. So 750 ml of normal saline is instilled into the stomach via nasogastric tube. So we inject 750 ml of uh, normal saline into the stomach and after half an hour it is aspirated back. So if the volume remained or if volume aspirated is more than 250 ml then it's a denote gastric outlet obstruction so this is goldstein saline load test now coming to the consequences or effects of uh, gastric outlet obstruction so it can be anatomical or it can be metabolic Coming to anatomical effect, so because of the obstruction, there is hyperperistalsis of the stomach in order to overcome the obstruction. 
So this leads to hypertrophy of the musculature of the stomach and ultimately later on a huge dilatation of the stomach occurs. So this is the anatomical effect of a gastric outlet obstruction in relation to stomach. Next we have metabolic effect. Because of persistent vomiting there is chronic dehydration, pre-renal agitemia sets in and there is loss of hydrogen chloride and potassium ion leading to hypochloremic, hypokalemic, metabolic alkalosis. Initially loss of hydrogen and chloride ions leads to hypochloric, hypochloremic, alkalosis and hypokalemia may not be obvious initially. So in order to compensate, the kidney tries to excrete low chloride and more of bicarbonate. So along with the excretion of uh, more bicarbonate, more sodium is also lost in the urine. And if vomiting persists, the patient becomes more dehydrated and uh, ultimately hyponatremia sets in. In order to conserve circulatory volume, now kidney reabsorbs water and sodium due to aldosterone effect. Sodium is retained by the distal convoluted tubules in exchange of hydrogen and potassium ion. So to conserve sodium, hydrogen and potassium are excreted in the urine. So more conservation of sodium leads to more excretion of hydrogen and potassium in the urine. So at this stage of metabolic alkalosis, the kidney passes acidic urine due to passage of more and more hydrogen ions in urine in exchange of sodium ion. This is known as paradoxical aciduria. So we say it paradoxical aciduria on the background of metabolic alkalosis. Besides this, excretion of potassium leads to hypokalemia. Due to alkalosis, plasma ionized calcium level will fall and leads to hypokalemia, which will be manifested as mental confusion and titanium. So these are the metabolic effects. Coming to the clinical features of a paradoxical aciduria, so they are irritability. Confusion, dehydration, convulsion can occur, and uh, sign strokes, breathing, and titany can occur. Regarding investigation, serum electrolyte, arterial blood gas analysis, and serum calcium is to be done and when the diagnosis is established it is treated with the double strength normal saline with the IV potassium under ECG control or monitoring. This is about the paradoxical aciduria. Coming to investigation of gastric outlet obstruction First, we have the contrast radiography or medium meal study. So, it will tell us about the obstruction. So, we can see absence of duodenal cap, dilated stomach where greater curve is below the level of eye crest, 
or barium mixed with uh, food residues also known as mottled stomach can be seen or a barium will not pass into the urine so these are the findings which we will get in gastric outlet obstruction barium in study is helpful when endoscope cannot be negotiated properly beyond the growth or in rhinitis plastica or where endoscope is not available. So in these circumstances, beta mill study is very helpful. However, nowadays, contrast CT scan has replaced the use of beta mean study for these conditions, which I have mentioned just now. So this is the barium mill study where we can see a hugely dilated stomach. So the investigation of choice is endoscopy. So by endoscopy we can visualize the stenosis as well as side by side we can take biopsy of the area. So endoscopy and the biopsy of the area around the pylorus is essential and uh, it gives us uh, a proper view of the senos area and uh, biopsy can be taken side by side to exclude malignancy. So via endoscopy, gastric juice can be collected, it is aspirated and uh, are examined for malignant cells by Capinicola stain. And if facilities available like endoscopic uh, ultrasound, it can be done, which shows depth of invasion of tumor in stomach wall and its uh, surrounding. So if facilities available, we can go for endoscopic USG also at the same time. Besides that, serum electrolyte is essential and if there is electrolyte abnormalities, it is to be corrected accordingly. And ECG is done to see hypokalemia. So these are the investigations. Coming to the management of uh, gastric outlet obstruction, the main aim is correction of uh, metabolic abnormality and dealing with the mechanical problem. So the patient should be rehydrated with intravenous isosonic saline with potassium supplementation. So replacing the sodium chloride and water allows the kidney to correct the acid base abnormality. It is notable that the metabolic abnormalities may be less if the obstruction is due to malignancy as the acid base balance is less pronounced. Side by side, correction of anemia, hypo proteinemia and other electrolyte abnormalities to be carried out. Correction of anemia is done by giving blood. Hyperproteinemia is corrected by infusing albumin and other electrolyte abnormalities are corrected accordingly. Total parental nutrition is to be given if it is available or if patient can afford as uh, mostly patients are malnourished because of prolonged obstruction. Gastric lavage is to be done. So the stomach should be emptied using a wide bore gastric tube. Gastric lavage is done before each feed four or five days prior to surgery with normal saline. So it removes food residue. 
it decreases the mucosal edema and it improves the gastric emptying time by increasing the gastric tonicity. That is why gastric lavage is important prior to surgery. Early cases may settle with conservative treatment with the anti secretory agent. So, initially, it is given intravenously to ensure absorption, and presumably, as the edema around the ulcer diminishes, as ulcer is healed. So initially we will try with conservative management. The measures which we have discussed is to be done and side by side anti-secretory agent is to be done. Or it's to be given mostly intravenously. If medical therapy fails then surgery is indicated. So if resolution or improvement is not seen within 48 to 72 hours of conservative measures, then surgical intervention will be needed or it is to be carried out. For benign cases, traditionally severe cases are treated surgically and where the cause is chronic duodenal ulcer, a truncal vagotomy with gastrogenectomy is preferred. So we prefer this locally. Otherwise, the recommenda recommendation is highly selective vagotomy with the gastrojejunostomy. So, highly selective vagotomy with gastrojejunostomy is highly recommended. And only problem with it is it is technically very difficult. So, this is uh, the procedure for a truncal vagotomy. So phrenoesophageal ligament is incised and this will lead to exposure of the esophagus. So here we can see this is the anterior uh, vagal trunk. So it is isolated. It is isolated and it will be transected. Similarly, we can see this is the posterior vagal trunk that is the isolated and uh, transected. So this finishes truncal vagotomy or we can say bilateral truncal vagotomy. And this is to be followed by gastrojejunostomy. So this is stomach and this is the jejunum. So anastomosis between the jejunum and stomach is done. So this is the preferred choice locally. But technically speaking, highly recommended one is the highly selective vagotomy with gastrojejunostomy. But this is highly challenging and technical. So already we have discussed this in the previous class. So here what is done? The supply to the fundus and the body is transected and we keep the nerve of latter jet which basically supplies the pyloric antrum. So this is highly selective vagotomy and this is to be followed by gastrojejunostomy. For malignant cases, in case of malignant obstruction, the surgical procedure depends on patient's disease profile. So as a guiding principle, major tumor resection is undertaken only in absence of metastatic disease. So if there is no metastasis, tumor resection can be done. And if, if there is metastasis, then palliative therapy is the treatment of choice. So endoscopic treatment with balloon dilatation has been practiced and may be most useful in early cases. So however, this treatment is not devoid of problems like dilatation leads to perforation or dilatation may have to be carried out several times. 
So this is basically reserved for early benign cases of gastric outlet obstruction. Other causes of uh, gastric outlet obstruction, we have uh, adult pyloric stenosis. This is a rare condition and its relationship to the childhood condition is unclear. Although some patients have a long-term history of problems with gastric emptying. It is commonly treated by pyloroplasty rather than pyloromyotomy. We have another condition that is known as the pyloric mucosal diaphragm. The origin of this rare condition is unknown. It usually does not become apparent until middle life. So when found, simple excision of the mucosal diaphragm is all that is required. So this is about the gastric outlet obstruction. So next we have perforated peptic ulcers. So the term perforated peptic ulcer is used for perforation of uh, duodenal ulcer or perforation of gastric ulcer or perforation of stomach ulcer. Despite the widespread use of a gastric antisecretory agent and uh, eradication therapy, the incidence of perforated peptic ulcer has changed little. Coming to perforated duodenal ulcer, it is common in male. The male-female ratio is 8 is to 1 and it's most common between the age group of 35 to 45 years of age. Perforation may be precipitated by steroid, analgesics, especially NSAID, alcohol, smoking, etc. in person with history of peptic ulceration. So before that we have to know the stages in peritonitis. So we have three stages. Stage of chemical peritonitis or peritonism. Stage of illusion or uh, peritoneal reaction. And stage of bacterial peritonitis. So if uh, perforation occurs, so this leads to peritonitis and peritonitis has these stages the stage of chemical peritonitis or peritonism stage of illusion or peritoneal reaction and stage of bacterial peritonitis coming to the stage of uh, chemical peritonitis or peritonism immediately after perforation the gastric content escapes into the peritoneal cavity and this results in the stage of chemical peritonitis and this lasts for about two to four hours. So acute pain abdomen occurs so which starts in the right upper quadrant then radiates along the right paracolic gutter and later becomes generalized. Besides pain, there can be tenderness and uh, muscle guarding all over the abdomen. Features of stalk can be seen if not treated. That includes tachycardia, sweating and hypotension. And on physical examination, there will be obliteration of uh, liver dullness. This is important in the diagnosis of a perforated duodenal ulcer or gastric ulcer. Next stage we have the stage of illusion or peritoneal reaction. So peritoneum secretes excess amount of peritoneal fluid to neutralize chemical irritant. And so initially pain reduces and patient feels better in this stage. So this phase lasts for 
about six hours. So patient will have increasing pulse rate, that's tachycardia, there will be hypotension, there will be dehydration. The generalized tenderness all over the body will be noted and bowel sound will be absent in this stage. Next we have stage of bacterial peritonitis. The bacteria from the gut migrate into the peritoneal cavity via the perforation site and causes bacterial peritonitis. So here patient becomes critically ill, look toxic and dehydrated. Features of uh, septicemic shock appear which includes the rapid feeble pulse, cold, calming extremities, shallow respiration and hypertension. There will be generalized abdominal distension and tenderness and bowel sound will be totally absent in this state. Regarding the clinical features, the classical presentation is instantly recognizable. The patient who have a history of peptic ulceration develops sudden onset, severe persistent generalized abdominal pain as a result of the irritant effect of the gastric acid on the peritoneum. So rebound tenderness and tenderness all over the abdomen will be present. Fever, vomiting, dehydration which features of shock like tachycardia, hypotension and sweating will be there. The abdomen becomes distended and gradually exhibit a board like rigidity and the patient is uh, disinclined to move because of pain. The abdomen does not move with respiration. So there will be obliteration of uh, liver dullness in right mid axillary line and uh, the abdomen will be silent and there won't be any bowel sound heard. Terminally ill patient may have oliguria, septicemia, features of shock, hypocritic faces with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Hypocritic faces include sunken eyes, cold periphery, and shallow rapid breathing. So this occur in terminally ill patients. In some patients, the leak from the ulcer may not be massive. There, they may present only with pain in the epigastrium and the right iliac fossa as the fluid may track down the right paracolic gutter. Sometimes perforation will seal as a result of inflammatory response and adhesion within the abdominal cavity and so perforation may be self-limiting in such cases. Coming to the investigation, an erect plain chest x-ray will reveal free gas under diaphragm in more than 70 percent of cases but CT imaging is more accurate and similarly erect plain picture abdomen will also reveal free gas under the diaphragm so free gas under the diaphragm especially in the right side is of importance so this is the x-ray the importance is to be given in the right side. So this is the diaphragm, this is the gas, and this is the liver shadow. So there is a gas under the diaphragm. So this is the uh, X-ray showing that. So it denotes there is perforation, secondary to peptic ulcer or any hollow viscous perforation. This is a, also another picture. So this is the diaphragm. This is the liver area and here we can see the gas. 
so this is gas under the diaphragm here this is the normal gas this is bundle gas so here also we can see this is the diaphragm and this is the bundle gas this is the diaphragm and this is the free gas under the right dome of diaphragm So free gas under the diaphragm is seen in perforation of hollow viscous containing gas or penetrating injury of abdomen, bullet injury of abdomen or following laparoscopic procedure or open surgery, following tubal insufflation test for tubal potency in females. Perforation of uh, hollow viscous, it can be peptic ulcer perforation, perforation of uh, malignant gastric ulcer, small gut perforation due to tuberculosis, typhoid, Crohn's disease, or they can be due to large gut perforation or blunt trauma abdomen causing perforation of uh, bowel or bowel transaction. So all patients should have a ceramomyelase level tested as a differentiation between peptic ulcer perforation and pancreatitis. So often there is a confusion between these two entities. So beforehand ceramomyelase level is uh, to be tested. It can be elevated following perforation of uh, a peptic ulcer also. Unfortunately, the level are not usually as high as we see in case of acute pancreatitis. And if doubt remains, a CT scan will normally be diagnostic in both conditions. Coming to the treatment part, the initial priorities are resuscitation, antibiotics, and analgesia. So resuscitation is carried out with the uh, ringer lactate, normal saline, and DNS. Antibiotic is uh, to be given. So preferred antibiotics are cefotaxim, metronidazole, and micapsin. Analgesics should not be withheld for fear of removing the sign of an catastrophe. In fact, adequate analgesia makes the clinical sign more obvious. Catheterization with the Follis catheter is to be done and nasogastric aspiration with the Riles tube is started. Following resuscitation, the treatment is principally surgical. So laparotomy is performed usually through an upper midline incision. The most important component of the operation is the, a thorough peritoneal toilet to remove all the fluids and food debris which is present in the peritoneal cavity. So infected fluid is sucked out, the perforation is identified and is closed with the uh, interrupted horizontal switches reinforced with a mantle patch that is known as Gram's patch using either vicryl or silk. This is the picture showing perforation. So this is the perforation side and three switches, horizontal switches are taken. This is the vicryl material. So it is taken and next the omentum patch will be placed here and the switches are will be approximated. So these are the placement of switches being made. The omentum is uh, placed over the perforation side and it is tied. Peritoneal toileting is done using 5 liters of uh, normal saline usually 
whole peritoneal cavity is uh, clean all the excess fluids are sucked out through suction and drains are placed and abdomen is closed so alternatively laparoscopy may be used and the endoscopic uh, closure of perforation is also possible and if the patient present very early then laparoscopy is 100% uh, possible next we have the perforated gastric ulcer so commonly ulcer in the lesser curvature near the antrum perforate amount of the gas escape is more than that of perforated duodenal ulcer so gastric ulcer should if possible be excised and closed so that malignancy can be excluded so the biopsy should be taken from the margin of the perforation and then it is to be closed distal gastrectomy including the ulcer area is better option if patient's general condition is favorable so if the condition of the patient is favorable so distal gastrectomy should be done and if the condition general condition is not favorable then simply closure of the perforation by taking biopsy is to be carried out so important here is we have to rule out malignancy thank you